Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about my hobby that I've been working on, which is getting R and a Shiny server set up on a Raspberry Pi, or as I now like to call it, my personal Ohio supercomputer. It's not nearly as powerful. Uh, it doesn't do nearly as much, but it's a fun learning experience as far as getting into interacting with a computer that doesn't really have any obvious entry point because there's no keyboard, there's no monitor on which you can attach it. So how do you use this sort of thing? Um, and that gets me into the table of contents. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about why I would want to do this. And then I'm going to, you know, lay out the guide as to how to do this and show you uh, a very simple, and I cannot emphasize this enough, it's an incredibly simple quote unquote machine learning model embedded into a shiny application. We'll end with an overview of uh, what we've kind of learned here today and then where I think something like this could go to next for me personally or for anybody who wants to take on this painstaking challenge of getting a shiny server onto a Raspberry Pi. Um, and so with that, why? Well, I got a Raspberry Pi as a Christmas gift a couple of years ago and I needed to make use of it and do something cool with it. So that's one reason. Then there's the other reason, which is shinyapps.io, which is a really easy and awesome way to deploy uh, shiny web applications, only allows up to five web apps active at any one time on their free tier. And as my Raspberry Pi gift was also free to me, I kind of view those in the same thing. And I'm wondering if I could store more applications on a Raspberry Pi than on shinyapps.io. But really, the main point about this is to learn for myself all about servers and networking and source installation and compilation of software and a whole new world of programming in the, in the likes of like terminal commands and Git and Linux. And so we're going to talk a little bit about more of that. Um, and, and what this really expands upon is, is how, how much more there is to support a, a, a machine learning model in a, in a web application to make that model usable. As uh, I, I first came across R in grad school, which was, which was great. And, and then as I got into industry, you know, I was so obsessed with my little machine learning model or my little like, you know, basic regression model. And I thought that, that was the end all be all. I was always focused on learning new algorithms for making better predictions with more data, different kinds of data and stuff like that. And then I started to realize that there's this whole other world. And I actually, I wish I had an Aladdin meme or something in here because there's this whole other world out there in, in the support systems and the infrastructure that it takes to make usable our, our, um, our, what I now consider small machine learning models. This, this is what a lot of us as data analysts, da citizen data scientists, PhD actual data scientists, it's this little green box that we're working on, but there's all of this other stuff. And don't get me started about the nebulous cloud infrastructure that can, all of this can be wrapped on top of. You've got virtual machines and all sorts of stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, we have a user interface and some visualizations that are, you know, using, you've got data ingestion processes and storage of that data. And then you got to handle load balancing and you got to have security. Not anybody can just log into this. And then, and then all of that is fed through into your machine learning model and you get some results and hopefully those results are useful to some people, but there's a whole lot more in the background that goes on. And I kind of wanted this to be a project for me as a personal hobby, but so that I could be a better communicator and uh, a better translator between the IT personnel and the leadership personnel within my company. Um, and so that's kind of why I wanted to do this. So now we're going to get into a little bit of the how. I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through this step-by-step -step guide um, and, and you know, show you a little bit of the things that we can do. The Raspberry Pi comes standard with, uh, they, they have a, a micro SD card basically, and you would flash the latest um, operating system onto that micro SD card. And that, uh, that operating system is affectionately called Raspbian. 
um, which is just a Debian version uh, uh, distribution specifically built for the ARM architecture of this chip. Uh, an interesting note, side note, is that Raspberry Pis are built off the ARM architecture. And if anybody's been paying attention to Apple lately, they just came out with an ARM chip version of their MacBook Pro, their iPad series, and, and everything like that. It's an M1 silicon chip. The problem is that R doesn't have the latest Fortran compilers built for it. And so it, there, you'd have to install a whole bunch of stuff from source instead of just doing a default R and R Studio install. So Mac is not really up and running yet um, with their new M1 silicon chips. But this is kind of, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of installation of, of software from, from source code. And I had never had any experience with that before taking on this hobby project of mine. But one of the ways that you can, okay, so we're going to get, now assume we have flashed this operating system. We're going to, we have to interact with the, the Raspberry Pi. It doesn't come with a monitor or a keyboard or anything like that, but I can use my MacBook or a personal PC using PuTTY or Terminal to remote into that. But to do that, I have to add an SSH file to the boot drive. Once that's done, I can eject it and insert the SD card into my Pi, and then I can you know, connect the Pi into a power source and an ethernet cable. Um, either directly into uh, my, my PC to share my wired connection or directly into my router to, to get um, an Ethernet directly to the Pi. Um, you use a simple SSH command with Pi at the Pi's IP address, and then we want to update and upgrade the software on the Pi. Um, and then if you can change your password, a lot of this stuff is available. You know, this is like this basic setup for a Raspberry Pi all comes from the Raspberry Pi org. They have tons of forums and tutorials. That's where I, I learned most of this information. Um, but now we're going to get into setting up the basic server environment. And Nginx is a classic and so is post PostgreSQL for a database for managing and storing our data that we would like to use and persist into our web application. Um, and Nginx is just a classic HTML server that will, that will be used to host sort of on the back end the, the Shiny application. Um, so those are as simple as basic terminal commands. Sudo is a super user. You're going to go out and get the, and install the Nginx. And then I learned a whole bunch about like ch own commands and like what these numbers mean. Uh, seven is just basically, you know, there are, there are three, there are three numbers here um, because there are three classes of ownership and ability for any file and folder structure. Um, and so seven is read, write, and execute. And it could be for owners and then for, uh, for groups and then for others is that that's what the three stands for. So zero can't do anything, but seven can do everything for owners and uh, groups. And then we'll use the same similar command to install uh, PostgreSQL and um, a couple of other things to get our, our database working. Now we need to install some dependencies in order to install R from source using tar files. And that's this code here. This is all done in terminal from, from my MacBook Pro once I'm logged in and SSH'd into, secure shell SSH'd into the Raspberry Pi. We're installing live curl, we're installing wget, we're installing a whole bunch of JPEG things. Um, and then we can go in and go ahead and get from our studio the latest version of the tarball of, of our studio. Um, and then we can uh, configure and use make to install that and remove our dependencies. I'm not gonna read all of this code to you. It's here in the slides if you wanna use this for yourself later. Uh, I believe all of, the, all of these um, presentations will be, will be handed out for those that want to, to view them. Um, but once we get that, that, that should work ideally. You know, we should have um, a, an R, 402 folder that has all the binaries and everything in it that we want to be able to, to, to run R on the Raspberry Pi. After that, it's time to, to run R and download some 
and install some packages from CRAN. And we use that using our super user command to call R and then run the install packages command just like you would in R Studio. So here I've, I've installed Shiny and Dplyr, TidyR, and ironically or coincidentally RCPP. Uh, next I need to add CPP11, I guess. Um, from there, uh, we have to install CMake in order to, uh, which is a native build environment for compiling source code. And this example here, you know, we use wget to go out and grab the 3.17 version. You can run out to the CMake files to find the latest version. Um, it basically, uh, uh, from, a, from a very simplistic understanding of what CMake does, it, it allows me to build Shiny Server. That's, that's the easiest way on the Pi. I don't, I don't know enough about the details, I'm gonna be honest, but I'm grateful that, I've, uh, that I can use it. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna set up the Shiny Server installation. And this is where Git comes in handy. We're gonna grab the Shiny Server from the, from the RStudio Git folder. Um, we're gonna make a temporary directory and then go out and, and make and build and compile using CMake. The, uh, the, the, basically, we're, we gotta grab Node.js, we have gotta grab a bunch of other different things um, and you can, you get a SHA code from the latest distribution of Node.js if you don't wanna run 1215. I believe they're up to like 14 or version 16, something like that. Um, and, and basically run this set of commands. And then at the end, you have a make install. And after you've run this, this takes a while to actually to, to compile. The, the Raspberry Pis, while they are my own personal, while this is my own personal Ohio supercomputer, it's not very fast and it doesn't have a whole lot of power. Four gigs of RAM, which is way better than it used to be, but still not, not everything. So go grab a cup of coffee or a few, go out to lunch and wait until this is done. And then you can configure the, uh, the Shiny server. And this is just adding different folder structures um, and directories within the Shiny server framework so that you can add your apps to them and they can be served on your, uh, on your, on your HTML uh, server application. Um, and so, you know, we have this server, the one, the one folder that I do want to point out um, most is the server, Shiny server. This is the folder that we'll be using to, to copy and paste any apps or build any apps and host them on there. You've got your UI and your server.r files or all in one in an app.r file. And then uh, we'll provide ownership permissions with read, write, and execute for all three uh, class types, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, and then finally, part two, we want to uh, enable an auto start feature. So if the Pi is, is um, will reboot automatically and updates and stuff, if you set your Raspberry Pi up to do that, which we, we ha I haven't done in this particular example, every time the Pi reboots, the Shiny server will, will boot up and start again. And then you can run at the, this below command at the very bottom um, to, to start your Shiny server. And I'll show you what that looks like and how, and we're, we're gonna go through a live sort of short live code demo of, of what it looks like to log into my Pi uh, and, then, and then start the Shiny server and go look at the, the little, mini uh, machine learning web app that I did. There are also some other permissions set up that you can do for adding users like Shiny apps and Shiny and the Pi. Um, and so that's a little bit of code to do that. Uh, and now, now, that, now that we've added permissions, we've configured our, our Shiny server, we can go ahead and uh, basically add an app if you like to to that server folder. So I've developed an app.r file on my Mac PC, and I can secure copy it from my Mac PC to, to the Raspberry Pi folder using secure copy in the terminal program. That's already done. Uh, so so uh, then we can go ahead and log in to the Pi 
and view this web application on our local Wi-Fi network only uh, to, to view what the, the app looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, seven. It's gonna ask me for my password. Pi software comes standard with the password of Raspberry, but you know, for your own personal protection, it's important to change your password, and that's really easy to do. Um, and like I showed in this slide, we're gonna use this code to start our Shiny server. And that should be started. And then we can go to our web browser. And we can go to, to, we'll go to, we've started that Shiny server on port 3838. Um, it's the same IP address as the Raspberry Pi has on my local area network uh, or Wi-Fi network. And so we go to, we go to an, an index tab and there's an example, uh, the, the classic example for Shiny Server web app, or there's my app, which is the one that I've already built and maintained. And a little bit about that before we go and visualize it for sure. It is super simple. It doesn't actually use that uh, SQL database that I installed. Uh, it's using the, the Iris data set. And I'm doing a logit uh, generalized linear model, and I'm building you know, uh, a simple title panel fluid page with a, an output prediction and a plot, if you will. And then we run that. This is, it's, it's as simple as it gets. It's a two, two input model to predict the likelihood of, uh, of a species type, for instance. And it's running a little slow, but it's coming. But then I, the cool thing about this is like, you know, if I wanted to build something, you know, for my management team at work, you know, now I have the experience of interacting with a server and getting the, you know, the uh, allowing people that want to interact with the model itself to be able to, to, to do that. You know, we've got toggle effects here where we can change the prediction value. And so, as you know, you slide the width of your pedal or the length of your sepal width, it changes the prediction value of the likelihood of whether the species is virginica or not, basically. Um, and so with that, um, you know, as kind of a, a, you know, an overview of what we've learned, we've, I learned how to flash an operating system. I'd never done that before. Um, I learned how to access a remote server using Secure Shell. Um, I learned a bunch about basic terminal commands and uh, how to install a basic HTML server using Git, using a, installing a SQL database. Um, but, but most importantly, I have a newfound appreciation for all, like, like for the longest time, my, my focus had always been on making the model and making a good model. And there's a, there's a person and that is their job for sure. But now I have a newfound appreciation for everything else that goes on in the infrastructure and the software to support that model and get it and make it the most usable and efficiently usable as possible. So we've learned a lot. Um, from here, where I think I would want to take this is to redo all of this using Docker or some container orchestration. Or if I don't feel like that, do a fully full-fledged end-to-end machine learning model for something a little more complex where the cool thing about the Raspberry Pi is where you can like attach like temperature sensors or like humidity sensors, all, all sorts of things can be attached to this little device. It, it's crazy. So, you know, throw a temp sensor on here, you know, and, and, and create a data engine to read and, and write that data to my, the SQL database that, we, that I installed, um, and then feed that into a machine learning model and visualize the inputs and results through a Shiny app um, and, and make it usable. And, and then it just sits out here. A lot of times, I think a lot of data analysts they spend so much time trying to put together reports in Excel or PDF form. And even if it's a weekly or a daily report that goes to their leadership team, uh, they spend a lot of manual effort doing this. But if you can get a server up and running for your organization and, and host the results and the reports on that server that just updates automatically and only the code base needs maintained every so often, 
I think that makes everybody much more productive and much more, uh, much more valuable in the end. Um, so, so sources and citations, uh, I actually, when I, I did this for the first time, like two years ago before being asked to present at this conference. And I'm so, I'm super grateful, but I had to go back and relearn everything and much uh, to my appreciation, I found this particular, uh, our studio community post that basically shows you exactly, this is where I got all of this code, this screenshots, like I did not create this and code is shareable. I mean, that's the whole point, but, but the R Studio community and the Raspberry Pi community are super, I'm super grateful for, um, you know, the forums online, uh, they, there's so much knowledge to be shared out there. Um, I also want to say thank you to, uh, to Saturday folks for hosting me and, and, uh, and, and putting this on together. Uh, this has been a blast and I'm excited to, I've, it's awesome to see the presentations that have been here so far and to see, I'm looking forward to see what's coming up next. So thank you. Well, thank you, Matthew. This was a great talk. I'm sure you uh, got a bunch of other tinkers out there kind of pumped up and now they're like, well, yeah, I'm going to start a project too. I've been seeing all these Raspberry Pis out there and just like waiting for my turn, you know, I should be doing it too. So I'm, I'm hoping that this will be uh, getting a lot of other people excited too. Um, and I guess related to that, I will be asking, what is the timeline for this project? So when you first started and kind of the end to it, um, how long did it take you? Uh, well, so I've done this twice because like I said, I did it about two years ago and it took me, it took me probably two months because there wasn't a, a very concise, uh, our studio community, uh, write up of, of how to do it all. So I was kind of like going through and picking things and piecemealing, working them together. Um, but then to go back and, and having to relearn how to do it, thankfully with this and some other tutorials, it took me about two weekends because um, there are still some troubleshooting. You know, tutorials are, are only uh, updated as of the day that they were written and then the next day they are obsolete and things break and they don't work. So even though there's that great tutorial out there, I guarantee that if someone were to try and use my slides or use that link to go and do this themselves, they would still find themselves in some in some bit of trouble and needing to troubleshoot. So yeah, about two weekends, two solid weekends. <laughs> Probably a good point. So I have a couple of questions actually. One of the really popular one is, uh, any thoughts or possibilities on using multiple pies for a Shiny app in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there, are, there are tutorials out there on the Pi organization uh, forums where they actually create what they what they affectionately call uh, the octopi, which is basically eight pies hooked together, and they're running a Kubernetes cluster, and they've got an orchestration pi that handles all of the load balancing on everything, and they basically make their own mini supercomputer. Each one of the new Raspberry Pi fours has about four gigs of RAM, so you know multiply that by by eight, and you 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 could have some some power in your hands. Um, yeah. That's, that's really cool. Um, and another question is a little bit more philosophical and, and asking, what was the biggest paradigm shift you had after completing this project? So, say again, sorry. What was the biggest paradigm shift you had after completing this project? You had mentioned wanting to grow into a bridge between IT and leadership. Yeah, I, so just being able to, to the paradigm shift for me was really appreciating all of the back end work that goes on to making my success as a, as a data citizen data scientist or data analyst possible. Like, you know, I spent a lot of time just so focused on how important the model is, but really having a good back end and infrastructure and the time and detail that it takes to do that. A lot of leadership personnel don't really appreciate that so much. They think, well, it's all computer. It just does it for you. And it doesn't do it. There's a lot of manual labor that goes into making things like this possible. Oh, yeah, that's our pain for all of us, don't we know? <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Matthew. This was a great talk. Um, you, and we will leave the chat on this time, actually, for the break. So if you have any additional questions for the speakers and speakers, if you're around, please feel free to chat with the um, audience and audience just with each other. Hopefully that will generate some good questions and good conversation. So thank you very much for that. And then I will let the uh, next speaker take over, Trevin Flickinger.